our guest speaker tonight is, is Dan Hume. Uh, he's uh, with the autonomous car maker 5AI. We all wish living car free would be more convenient. Uh, we all want cars to be safer around people. And uh, the local uh, the local company 5AI is working towards these goals. So, uh, Dan, would you like to uh, begin? Okay. So, I thank you all for inviting me to speak. And. Aha, so yeah, oh, no, I'm on the wrong side now. So, you want to get rid of motorists? Am I? Uh, I thought I wouldn't get much argument for that. I just want them to be away from me. Uh, how do I get back to the first slide? Come on, Robin, you set this up for me. Come on, enter. Aha! Oh, there's music, I wasn't expecting music. <laughs> I was expecting a bit more video than this, though. So, this. Oh, here we go. So this footage was on Horizon a couple of weeks ago. They did a lovely program um, about our company. They were very flattering. It's nice to be featured there. Um, and so, yeah, you want to get rid of motorists. Imagine a road network without motorists. 94% of accidents are caused by drive that error. So if we had no motorists, that would be 94% of accidents just gone overnight. Well, unfortunately, I'm not here to get rid of all motorists. Uh, you know, that's too big a task for me alone. Sorry to disappoint you. You, you can go home now if you want a refund. But uh, the motorists that we are going to get rid of are probably here in this room. So, hands up everybody who doesn't own a car. That's kind of unsurprising. Okay, why? Why do you not own a car? Can't afford it. You can't afford it? That could be one reason. Don't need one. Yeah, especially in Cambridge. Well, who needs a car, right? Everything's close together. It's flat. Why would you need one? But actually, sometimes you do need one. So all of the, the non-car owners, put your hand up again if you haven't used a different mode of transport this year. So a car, a taxi, a train. If you haven't, keep your hand up. So lots of hands are going down because like, you can't cycle everywhere. You can't cycle to the other end of the country. You can't cycle when you're moving house. You can't cycle... <laughs> well, okay, I've seen, I've seen the pictures on the internet of people with like huge trailers moving their whole household in one go. So maybe you can sometimes, but it's not for everyone. And of course, not everybody lives in a city, they live in the middle of nowhere, maybe they, all the places they want to go to are far away. So there are other modes of transport, but they're also they're not great. What, what's inconvenient about these modes of transport? Um, something might be happening here. Train. Trains, like they're good for going a long way away, but you have to get to the train station first. So you need to get a taxi to the station. If you're taking luggage, if you're, taking luggage, if you're going to the train station in order to go to the airport to go on holiday with loads of luggage, Never done that. maybe you want a taxi, maybe you want to park your bike trailer at the station. I really don't feel comfortable that, that's parking. That's why you have a box on the front fit the suitcase in Okay. <laughs> and, and you buy the suitcase to fit the bike. <laughs> ah, nice. I wish I thought of that. Yeah. Um, I have one of those wheeled ones, and I thought yeah. about like using a bungee cord to just let it run along the trailer, but no, I don't think that would work out for me. Um, so yeah, trains, they're, they're really good, but they, you have to go to where the train is, and then they run on their own timetable. They, they don't, they're not when you want. What you really want is a train that like, is outside your doorstep, which might be good if you live by the new station. It's just like the trains have appeared by your doorstep, and you want them to go to the other place, and you want them to be exactly the right time, but no, they, they run to their own timetable. Um, buses as well, they're, they're more local than trains, and they're closer, but again, they don't always go where you want. And again, you have to get to the bus when it wants to leave, not when you want to leave. Uh, taxis, taxis are great, right? They, they come to you, and they go to where you want, but they're really expensive. So, not everybody wants taxis. You wouldn't take a taxi every day, maybe. And what else do we have? We have hire cars. Hire cars are great for longer journeys if, if it's somewhere where the trains don't go. If you're going from Cambridge to Millbrook, for instance, Millbrook's a, a test track where we do most of our stuff. You can't get a train there. You can't get any public transport there. It's in the middle of nowhere. We have to hire cars when we want to go there. Um, but if you're going for a night out, you wouldn't hire a car to go there because you can't drink. You don't want to drink and then you're stuck with this hire car. You can't go anywhere. And you still have to have a license. So you have this problem where... Um, you know, the hire cars, whether they're a zip car, like in this picture, they don't want to talk to you until you've had a license for three years. And I don't want to get the driving license and then not drive for three years because I don't own a car, and then drive a hire car. That's just awful. So the, the people who are causing the bad journeys are us, really, because we're stuck to these bad methods of 
transport the buses that are gigantic in your towns and, and cause lots of traffic issues, or the hire cars that are being driven by people who don't drive very often. So how are we going to fix this? And 5AI is going to fix this by offering autonomous vehicles. So this is mobility as a service. It's a new form of public transport that solves these problems. And it's also a lot cheaper because the most expensive part of a taxi is paying the humans to sit there all the time. So it's cheaper, it's convenient because they go where you want to go, and it's safe because you don't have humans in the loop causing all of these 94% of crashes. Um, so this is a kind of a more corporate slide. It's a bit off my main point, but they kind of the corporate people insisted I put it in. Why are we in the UK? You might have heard there's people like Uber and Waymo, and they're They've got their own research programs to try and produce self-driving cars, and they're all on the west coast of America. Why are we not there? Why do we think that there's a company in the UK? And it's because we have all the knowledge. We have universities in Oxford with all of these people who, like, as you're not in the industry, you might not have heard of them, but you might have heard of some of them. These are all big names. These are the rock stars in computer vision. And uh, they're in Oxford. They're here. They're in London. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're in Edinburgh as well. When I get there we go. So there's all of this talent in the UK, and this is what we are building on. We have offices in all of these dots. Uh, so we're kind of quite big for a startup. We're, we're quite distributed, and we're using this knowledge to build this new mobility as a service. And the government wants to support us. So if you look at Transport Research Authority, they do a lot of projects, and Transport for London, they're a public transport agency. If you've heard about Uber, and maybe uh, people might have some opinions about Uber and how they do business, they've shown that they really don't like working with regulators, they don't like working with the government, they just want to do their own thing, and you know, regulators are just stifling us and, and shutting us down, our innovation man. We're not like that, we want to work with government, we've got, we're working with regulators to define what the regulations are going to be for self-driving cars in this country, and we're aiming to integrate with existing public transport. So we're not trying to be like Uber and, and decimate public transport and put all the taxis out of business and put all the buses out of business. We want to fill the gaps in the existing public transport network. Um, so what this announcement is, which was a few months ago, is a project that will be in London in a few years' time, and it's particularly in an area of London that is not well served by the public transport at the moment. Um, the buses don't go there, it's not on the tube, and so there's a load of people who want to not drive, and they don't have an option at the moment. And so we're going to help them out with that. Um, so how is this going to benefit the people in the room? Um, you know, even if you don't want to take our cars, how will this benefit us? Well, there's three ways, really. The most immediate benefit is the 94% of accidents that we have now that they won't cause anymore. They won't get impatient, they won't get drunk, angry, tired, they won't overtake you too close to punish you for being on the road. Um, there's all kinds of things that they're just not going to do anymore. That's a big topic. There's going to be more than this, so I'm going to come back to that later. The second thing is there's an opportunity to reduce journeys at an individual level. We don't with a single passenger each, like you see on Milton Road at Rush Hour or the A14. We want to get full occupancy, and if you look at the people that are running these new services like Uber, yeah, they have UberX and Lyft have Lyft Line. They're sharing services where the centralized dispatch system matches you up with people who are going the same direction as you. So it kind of, it's like a hybrid between a taxi and a bus. You're sharing with people who you didn't prearrange to, the computers assign you some people. So rather than having four taxis going in vaguely the same direction, you have one. So we're reducing journeys this way. And as well, we've just talked about journeys where car ownership is currently the easiest thing to do. And by filling in the gaps and making those journeys easier to do with our service, we're going to make it easier for people to move to car-free living. Um, so reduced car ownership then kind of feeds in, that you're less tempted to get up in the morning and be lazy and go, oh, well, I've got a car on my driveway, I might as well use it. So there's, that's like three main benefits for the people in this room, and for everyone, really, because you know, we all know it's not just cyclists who benefit from reduced traffic and safer roads, it's for pedestrians and even the other motorists who uh, sometimes won't be helped. Um, so at this point, I want to make it clear again, I've used the phrase mobility as a service, it's very business speaking at the moment. 
And what does that mean? It means we are not selling cars. We are not Tesla. We don't want to sell you a car. If Tesla gets their way and everyone owns a self-driving car, then we'll have things like people avoiding expensive parking in Cambridge by getting their car to drive them into town and then getting their car to drive itself back out to somewhere where there's parking. That's just doubled the number of journeys on the road, right? We've already seen this problem with the park and ride, mm -hmm. where people drive their families into town and then drive back out to the park and ride and then use the park and ride to get back in and then do the same thing in reverse when they're going home. It's just doubled the number of journeys. We don't want that. That's awful. Um, but we don't think that the economics of Tesla's strategy add up at all. So, if you look at the kind of driver assist features that Tesla have got going on at the moment, they're here in terms of the amount of autonomy and the way they can work and where they can work. And so they have requirements for how much like, sensor and how much processing power they need, and there's a cost requirement that goes along with that. So Tesla really is putting five to $10,000 on the price of their car by adding the features that they have now. And Tesla's made a big deal of, uh, they've said things like, uh, the cars that we're putting on the road now have all of the hardware, all of the sensors, all of the computers that they need for complete self-driving. But they've already been caught out in that. They've, so they've um, silently uh, replaced the boards in their computer, the boards in their cars with ones with more processing power because they've realized that they were wrong. And so maybe they can get away with charging you uh, an extra £10,000 on the price of a luxury car, because Tesla cars are not for everyone, right? They are high-end cars. So maybe that works out for them, but it doesn't work out for the whole car market, right? You just can't put ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars dollars $30,000 on every car. But you can amortize that over the cost of a vehicle that's owned by us and rented out by the hour. So we think the economics don't support private car ownership in a world of self-driving cars. They support a car that you hire, and the cost of all that computer is cents to a dollar, right, per hour. It's, it's all in dollars because, you know, you have investors. It's less than a dollar per hour. Of course, that's affordable. That's affordable for everyone. It's cheaper than a bus. There's also, in terms of this business model and mobility as a service rather than selling cars, there's also a uh, a safety implication that comes down to the economics of accidents in terms of uh, the motor manufacturers. So this chart's going to be a bit big. According to the Department for Transport, the total liability bill for road accidents in this country is about 30 billion pounds. So that's this, this is where we are now. So if we look at a car manufacturer, say, um, I should pick one out the top of my head, Ford. I'm not going to get Ford, so it's just like they're a popular one. Say Ford wants to introduce a new driver assist feature that, that adds more autonomy and makes the road safer. Let's say it can halve the number of human-caused accidents. But sometimes this feature will go wrong, and uh, whether or not that's their fault, whether or not it's preventable, that means there's a, a liability risk for them. I'm going to get tied up in court for the cost of money. So let's say it will also uh, just increase the number of accidents that they are having to pay for. So even though everybody benefits from this reduced accident cost, the manufacturers actually lost out. Their share of the pie has got bigger. So this prov provides a disincentive for Ford to make roads safer. If we didn't have this economic situation, we'd have had the kind of advanced driver assist features that we're seeing today, like automatic daily braking, like lane departure warnings. We'd have had those 10 years ago, 15 years ago. But the manufacturers have had a disincentive financially to start on this. And it's, it is actually Tesla that's been kind of shaking the industry up because they started with this, we're going to do things completely different mindset, and they've started providing these features even though it's bad for them. And it's kind of created a new consumer expectation that everybody should be doing it. And so it's, they're kind of pulling the industry along. Um, but yeah, we could have had really advanced safety features years ago if it weren't for the economics of accidents. But in our system, where we are owning the cars and operating the cars, whatever accidents happen, it's definitely our fault, right? The person who's sitting in there, like on their phone, riding it, they've just paid for a taxi. They're obviously not liable, it's going to be us. So we've got an incentive. We don't know how big this bar is going to be, but however big it is, it's on us to make it smaller. And we're financially incentivized to make every safety improvement we can, rather than draining our feet like the, the legacy auto industry. 
Um, so, sorry, this slide is a bit boring. How are we going to keep our bar small? In a way, it's very easy. Human drivers are really bad. So the bar for being safer than a human driver and for reducing the size of that bar from where it is now is it's a very low bar. Most driver errors result from lapses in judgments or from deliberate misbehavior or lazy misbehavior. So if our car can drive at all, if it can do anything at all, we've already got some advantages because it will be able to do that consistently day in, day out. Um, it won't get tired, it won't get angry, it won't get impatient. If it stops at three red lights in a row, it won't get to the fourth one and go, well, you know, I stopped for the last three and this one's only just turned red. I deserve to run this one. Um, so yeah, once we've taught it to overtake a cyclist safely, it will plan the maneuver every time. It won't go, well, I think there's a cyclist somewhere. It's not really overtaking if it's a cyclist. I'm turning left on you. <laughs> I was kind of hoping that somebody would do that to me on the way here tonight so that I have a really good story, but none. Um, <laughs> well, you know, it still happens sometimes. Um, but yeah, of course, it's not that simple, right? It's not just, oh, we can make it work once, it will work every time. So let's a look at some tricky situations that might come up in a typical urban journey. So I'm going to have to watch here. This is like a, one of those hazard perception tests. So here we've got different weather situations. We've got uh, a rainy road with loads of reflections on the standing water. Here we've got snow. You can't see any of the road at all. You can't see the road markings. You've just got these rooks confusing you. And um, even on sunny days, if we ever have them, you get lens flare in cameras. Ah, oh, suddenly you're blinded. You can't see anything. So these are all really hard situations. Uh, what else do we have? Oh no, it's a tourist on a higher bike. What are they doing? How do you predict their behavior? And, uh, oh, yeah, oh no, right, okay, that's so far. <laughs> but look, we can't even tell what is this supposed to be? Is this a car parking bay? All these road markings are, are really worn. Um, so we've got to be able to deal with all these different conditions, all these different weather conditions. We've got to be able to deal with the, the people on the bikes who, you know, maybe aren't the, the model cyclists that we all are, obviously. Um, and we've got these road markings that, you know, there are quite a lot of, but you can't really see what's going on. You also get debris in the carriageway. This is like a, you know, maybe a once in a year event that this might happen to you. And now suddenly there's a pedestrian, but there's a reflection of the pedestrian as well. This is the standing water again. Uh, I don't even know what that one is. I think that was another reflection there. What's that guy doing? He's really close to the road. Is he about to step out? Uh, there's some more reflections there. In, and we've got reflected cars in these windows. And so here's a situation that's uh, kind of you think requires some human judgment. There's a van over there, and we're on a road where you have to pull out into the middle to get past all the parked cars. Is the van pulling out or not? Well, actually, he's on hazard. He's not even waiting for us. And we can't see until we pull in there. It looked like he was just signaling right to pull out. So there's negotiation in those kinds of situations. And uh, we'll get another instance of that in a minute, where this guy coming up, I don't want to spoil it for you. <laughs> so we're waiting for this guy, we can see he's going to turn right across us, but uh, he splashed us, he wants us to go. That's a very human gesture, right? People don't always follow the rules, and sometimes when they don't follow the rules, it's because it's a tourist on a high bike, and sometimes it's because they're being nice to us. And we have to be able to deal with that. Um, also, uh, just recognizing objects and threats isn't enough. If we look at this guy on the left, he's looking over his shoulder. Does that mean he's about to step out into the road? So we need the car to not just recognize things, not just recognize objects, but to predict people's intentions from the flashing the lights, from looking over their shoulder before crossing. I don't even know what that thing is. I think that was the last hazard there. So there's all kinds of complexities. It's, it's not this simple one. There's all kinds of things that as humans we, we do on the road every day and we don't even realize we're doing them. You can be half asleep and, and realize you know, you're going down Union Lane Sunday and there's park cars on both sides and it's like, the police are going out and I'm pulling for this guy and, and this one's giving way to me. You don't even think about it, but for the computer we need to teach it all of these behaviors. But some of these events that we've seen here are like the boxes coming out to the middle of the road. These are really long tail events, you might call them. And so this comes down to what does it mean to be an experienced driver? Even professional drivers, taxi drivers, bus drivers, delivery drivers who are hours on the road eight hours a day every day, 
they very really very very rarely experience the extreme events like the snowy roads. You know, you get snow suddenly everybody forgets how to drive. People skid all over the place. Even on rainy days, right? Everybody forgets how to drive. Suddenly everybody's going along twenty miles an hour slower than normal. And it's like, do you not know how to drive anymore just because the roads are a bit wet? Because there are events that as an experienced driver, you get to experience a lot of boring driving and very little interesting driving. We get better at tricky situations by practicing them as humans. Um, but if somebody skids all the time and they've been in a lot of crashes, you wouldn't say they're a good driver, you'd say they're a bad driver. Uh, when we test and evaluate human drivers, the closest we come to simulating crash conditions is by tapping on the dashboard, and that's really not good enough to find out what somebody's actually going to do in, uh, in an emergency. We want every car to be as well trained as an expert stunt driver, like this guy. And we can do this with simulation. So when we test our cars, we don't just test them in the real world. We have a simulator where we can recreate situations that only happen every million miles of normal driving, or even less frequently. Uh, less frequently. Uh, situations like crashes that are expensive to, to recreate in real life. Um, by the time our cars run on public roads, they'll have handled millions of events that most human drivers only see once and maybe don't get to talk about it afterwards. And similarly to the kind of the myth of the experienced driver, how many times have you been in Cambridge and you've watched a driver and you've thought, you're not from around here, are you? Because they just don't know how to act around bikes. Or maybe they uh, go down Elizabeth Way and they don't expect you to pull out when you get to that really big pothole you have to pull out to avoid. There's, you know, every town has a few places like this where all of the locals have some shared knowledge about a pothole or a blind junction <laughs> or cyclists, the fact that you have lots of them, and people who are from around there don't have that knowledge. Whereas all of our cars will be the same, so if any of them have this local knowledge, they will all have local knowledge. We want all of the cars to be able to drive in every city. On top of this, we record telemetry about every journey we make in test, uh, it'll be true in the real world, and in our simulations as well. So we don't just record what the car saw, we also record, record what it inferred, and how it predicted other road users would behave. So when any car gets confused or makes a mistake, we can review the recordings, like you do after an air crash. Uh, we can reconstruct what caused the mistake, situation, near miss, whatever and we can create regression tests from those to make sure it won't happen again. So every car will learn from every other car's mistakes. Even when the mistake didn't learn to an accident, that didn't lead to an accident, we can build a, a what-if scenario. What if the same thing happened, but it was night time? What if the pedestrian was dressed in black? Would we have seen them later? Would we still have been able to pull up in time? What if we'd been going five miles per hour faster? Reconstructing events in this way already gives us a great source of data that the legacy car manufacturers don't have access to and the human drivers don't have access to. And once we're running on the open roads, it will just get better and better over time. This is like one reason why I envy Tesla, because they already have access to this. They have their cars, people are driving them on the roads, they can see all kinds of new events uh, that we have to simulate. And it will teach us about new kinds of events, maybe events that we couldn't have predicted because you know, the real world road users are very unpredictable sometimes. Um, okay, show hands, who hasn't heard about deep learning or neural networks? Some people, okay. So, let's talk a bit about that for the people who haven't then. So, you might have heard a bit of nonsense about artificial intelligence. Um, deep learning is, uh, well, okay, so let's start with neural networks. Neural networks are a technique that came from the 70s, 80s, that is about a way of making a computer learn a function. Uh, so you give it some inputs and you give it the desired outputs and it can learn the relationship between them. And the early systems that we had in the 70s and 80s were very simple. They could only learn very simple functions, so they could learn uh, if you give it the size of petals and the color of some petals, what kind of flower is it, that kind of thing. 
in the last few years, computers have got a lot more powerful. We have this new technique called deep learning, where you can make much more complicated neural networks, and they can learn more complicated functions, and they can predict all kinds of things that you couldn't do in the 80s. So um, many years playing Go was just like a thing computers couldn't do. It was too complicated for them. Whereas now computers can beat the best human players at Go, and it's thanks to deep learning. Um, but a lot of people talk about this, and they treat deep learning as if it's magic. It's some kind of unpredictable thing. It's just a big black box. You give it some inputs and outputs, and maybe it learned the thing you wanted it to learn, and maybe it just learned some other thing. There was a story that was told before the days of deep learning, when I was at school, about uh, some, some military types who wanted to train a, a machine learning system to spot camouflage tanks. So they gave it a load of pictures of camouflage tanks, one load of some pictures that had tanks in, and some pictures that didn't have tanks in, and they trained it to say these ones had tanks in, these ones didn't. And it worked perfectly, it was great. It worked on all of their test images. But the general who commissioned the system was really unconvincing. He was like, no, I want you to go and make some new test images, and uh, run all the tests again on these new images, and tell me what happens. And they got a load of new images, and it was wrong every time. Um, and what had happened was the images that they'd started with had been taken on different days. All the ones that had a tank in were on a sunny day, and all the ones without the tank in were a cloudy day. So they'd actually trained the machine learning system to recognize sunny days and cloudy days. <laughs> so this is this is kind of one of these fables, and it's kind of, everybody's really afraid of this. We don't want to make this system. And it's part of a kind of magical thinking about it. But really, the moral you should be taking for it is that these machine learning systems are just like any other computer system. It's like any program that you write by hand. You can't just do it and then hope that it will work in every circumstance. You have to test it, you have to debug it, just like any other program. And so the same engineering principles that we've been using for decades apply here too. You build it in separate modules, you test them all independently, you put them together, you test them together, you add a load of redundancy if you're doing a safety system like we are, you add a load of monitoring so that you can tell if things have gone wrong. Um, you might have heard of what researchers call the pixels to pedals approach. Has anybody heard of that? So this is a thing some researchers are doing, which is, um, I mean, it could be really scary. It's where you just have one big neural network and it learns the whole thing. You give it as the input the, the camera images and the LiDAR data, and you have it just produce the, the steering wheel commands and the pedal commands directly. So it's learning the whole driving thing as one neural network, and that's a really complicated function. And it's really great for doing experiments and for finding out what the limits of, of these deep learning systems are, but it's not what you do to design a real system because you can't test it in isolation. You can't find out what went wrong if it makes the wrong decision. You can't feed it new information easily. So it's a great experimental platform, but none of the cars that are on the roads, uh, or that, that will be on the roads, will use this system. Um, and ours certainly won't. They will look more like this. Uh, there's a little space bar pressing here. So this is one of our more popular slides. You can tell the ones that got uh, supplied to me because they have all the fancy animations. Yeah. Uh -huh. So yes, the, our cars will look more like this. There's a separate component for every job, and all of these components have defined interfaces between them, so that as humans, when we want to understand what the system is doing, if we want to see why it went wrong, and if we want to see if it's going wrong, we can look at the information and understand what the car decided, what the car's perceived which you couldn't do with, um, with one big system. So when we run in simulation, we can test one of these modules in isolation and have the simulator pretend to be the whole of the rest of the car, or we can test the whole thing together, and you know, we'll do both of those a lot. And when we run in the real world, having this isolation means that we can have health monitoring systems that can check all of the, the interfaces, check all of the intermediate results here. Are they same? Do they all tally with each other? Do they add up? And they can... Uh, restart and fix any components that are behaving out of spec. And we can also run redundant pairs of the components so that uh, we can find out if they start disagreeing and shut off anything that's uh, going wrong and continue running safely in those circumstances. Um, even an engineer who's never worked with AI before will tell you this kind of modularity is how you define safety critical systems. Um, and nothing has changed in that respect. So like, even though AI gives us a load of new capabilities, it lets us program things that we couldn't have done 10 years ago, it hasn't changed the way that we engineer safe systems. And so that's going to be just the same for these complicated self-driving systems as it is for the ABS controller on your car. 
you don't even think of with a computer. Um, in 5R in particular, we have a lot of experience of safety critical systems. We have people from the automotive industry who've designed these ABS controllers and engine management units. We have people who've developed medical devices, which are a lot more heavily regulated than the motor industry is. Um, we have people who've developed systems that have to run unattended in remote places for decades without failing. So um, designing secure systems, reliable systems that will carry on working forever is something we know how to do, and we're going to keep doing that. So if we go right to where we started, we've talked about the two parts of safety. We've talked about the eliminating the bad driving behaviors that you see now, and about how we'll make sure that our system doesn't introduce new kinds of bad driving behaviors by making it fail safe. Even if we do introduce some new kinds of misbehavior, they'll be a lot smaller than what we have to put up with from today's drivers and we'll be able to keep getting better over time. Uh, we've also looked at how better dispatch and ride sharing, the kind of the economic side of, of this system, is going to result in fewer car journeys at an individual level, and about how enabling car-free living with a new mode of public transport will promote reduced car ownership and make it easier for more people to, to join our club of living car-free. So to return to the opening point, we're not going to get rid of all motorists, we're just offering a new, safer, more convenient mode of transport. Some people enjoy driving, and those people are going to be on their roads for quite some time. But maybe in a few years' time, when the statistics have shown just how bad humans are at driving, people will start demanding to take human drivers off the road completely, and with the evidence to back that up, maybe that will happen. If that does happen, then I'm proud to be part of these guys taking the first steps along that road. Uh, as a company, we are aiming to grow to more than 100 people over the next year, so we have many open positions on our website. Uh, if you're an AI researcher or you have experience writing safety critical software, um, we definitely want to hear from you. And there are many other kinds of jobs on there as well. At the moment, we're actually desperate for an office manager for our Cambridge office. We've been trying to hire one for ages. <laughs> <laughs> I have to keep answering the door, it's not great. Um, also, if you're an early riser, um, listen to tomorrow's Today program. That sounds like the name of the program. The Today program tomorrow morning at uh, between 6 and 6.15, 6 where our CEO, who is this guy, Stan Bolland, he's a, a, a very old bod in the Cambridge startup scene. Um, he'll be making a big financial announcement along with Greg Clock who is uh, Secretary of State for Business Energy and Industrial Strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, do we have any questions? Yeah, I'll let the brilliant begin. You yeah, first. Okay. Is the uh, kind of one in a million carbon box event a significant cause of accidents or not really? So, not but that doesn't mean we should let them happen anyway. Do you have a size quantification? Uh, I don't have those kinds of figures, actually. We could probably find them out by looking at like, the Stats19 data. Um, and actually, we as a company have access to some uh, other accident data that's not in the public data set. So in a few months, we might be able to give you a very specific answer to that. So maybe you'll have to invite me back and I can tell you. <laughs> How we've progressed and what's going on. What sensors are you planning to use, and how do these sensors in particular affect cyclists? So there are, you mentioned cameras, there is mm -hmm. radar, because cyclists don't have a lot of metal on them compared to cars. Yeah, so we don't really there's use radar, which is quite expensive and seems to have disappeared from those prototypes. Uh, yeah, so we're focusing on cameras and radar. Um, our vehicle platform at the moment, I mean, the platform that we're on at the moment in terms of the hardware is not what we'll be running on the roads in a couple of years' time. So this is open to change. What we have at the moment is uh, 12 cameras, which is four, I think, facing forwards with two different stereo baselines uh, and all-round camera coverage. We've got currently a 360-degree LiDAR on the top, um, but we're going to move to multiple LiDARs on the corners. 
um, we shall get better coverage for obstacles. We do have radars, but we're not really using them for obstacle detection because of the kinds of problems you said. The main point of the radars is that they will help to supplement LIDAR in weather conditions that the LIDAR is not great for. So if it rains up, LIDAR is really bad in the rain, um, but radar is a lot better at penetrating the rain. So if we can help to filter out some of the noise that we get from the rain by adding our radar information, then that will make it easier to pick out hard objects like cyclists from all the, the traffic. Traffic's not really right, like the noise of the rain. What is LIDAR? Uh, so LIDAR is a laser-based system for um, detecting things, basically. So the kind of LIDAR systems that you get in London, they have a spinning mirror so you, and a laser beam, and so the spinning mirror makes the laser beam cover the surface a bit like a disco, and then there's also a light sensor that just kind of detects where the, the laser line is, and by processing the shape of the laser line, you can work out where the obstacles are. So it's Really, it's the best method of obstacle detection for a car because most things stand up quite well in LiDAR, better than they do in a camera image. But as I say, it has shortcomings like Tesla. Tesla for so Tesla, well, they started out running LiDARs on their experimental thing, but uh, I mean, that comes back to the economic situation. If you want to run a safe, fully autonomous system, you really need to have LiDARs. You can't make do with just camera. Um, but yeah, they're really... That puts you up this side of the Costco. Uh, I'm going to come to you in a minute. The other thing about Tesla is they really are not very good at detecting cyclists at the moment. So their autopilot features are for highway use where you only have cars because it's you know US, you don't have bikes on their highways. Um, and they warn people very strongly not to use autopilot features in an area with lots of cyclists. They're just not up to that yet. And again, we think they'll probably have to go to LIDARs or something like that. But Price of LIDARs is coming down, so maybe they'll get saved on us. Go ahead. Um, all cars have chips in their um, control system. Mm -hmm. Would it be possible to um, for new cars to then have um, a signal embedded in their control system chip? And also, would it be possible to say, you know how you can pop a tile and send a signal out from your bike mm -hmm. so that um, you can basically find your bike when it's stolen? But would it be possible for, in future, say, if you have an automated car and cyclists want their bikes to be recognised and safer for them then to buy like a tile chip that they can put on their seat so that your car can recognise the bike more easily and speed and things. It would be possible to have something like that, like a radar beacon. Uh, so like this is common in uh, the nautical world where small craft often have these, like, it's essentially a box corner reflector like you get on the back of your bike, but it's a big metal one which makes them a bigger radar target. But um, I was thinking more like mesh or something like that. Yes, so I mean that's possible. We really don't want to be in the position of telling cyclists, "Oh, you have to buy this extra thing to put on your bike, otherwise we might hit you." You know, <laughs> I can well imagine that by the time there are a few self-driving cars on the road, some enterprising people from China maybe will come out with uh, you know a snake oil thing, buy this plastic box and put it on your bike because it will make you safer. Honest, um, but yeah. We need to, do. it's like my attitude to um, motorists complaining about cyclists not being lit enough. If you're a motorist and you're driving the town, you have to be able to see pedestrians who aren't lit at all. It's not on the other road users to make things safe for themselves, right? It's on us to be safe for everyone else. When you're running a self-driving car, when you, whatever the vehicle you're running is, you have to make everybody else safe, it's your responsibility. And so we see this as our responsibility. We will detect all cyclists. Doesn't matter what you have on your bike, what you're wearing. Uh, there was one in the back corner. Yeah, here yeah. with the green. Yeah, so it's so, uh, actually a follow up to what you just said. Uh, what are the possible scenarios that you're wearing with self driving cars? Is it, if all the cars are, are self driving and they're all hyper aware of everything and they work perfectly as expected, mm -hmm. what's preventing people just going from like a walk of the road to the stop? The same thing that prevents people now, yeah. I mean, just because the cars have faster reactions and they can detect you, that doesn't mean they can change the laws of physics. The, the stopping distances will still be stopping distances, yeah. and you're still taking that chance. And it's, it's quite a heavy chance to take, because yeah, you've cool. got the most to lose, right? Am I, am I right? Did you say at the end that you guys don't see all cars being self-driving? We're not trying to make self all Do cars self-driving. Maybe that's a possible future, but that's not our business plan. Well, that, that would answer the question. Uh, so, Richard, yeah. 
So one of the concerns I've got with driving is a self-driving car is the ethics problem, the trolley problem, basically. Mm -hmm. if, if your few swerves hit five pedestrians or two, uh, that, that, that's a problem that even philosophers mm -hmm. can't really solve particularly well. How do, you, how, do, how do you get an AI to be ethical? Well, so this kind of comes back to the, um, uh, am I off the thing that Oh, but well, that wasn't what I was expecting. Um, In the, this slide. So this comes back to the economics problem I was talking about earlier. The this is a, a, another self-driving company called Nutanomy. They are uh, also in the UK. They're not as well funded as us, and they have a lot more people from the legacy auto industry. And this is what they think about the trolley problem. Would you prefer that? Option A is we'll definitely kill a pedestrian, but it's not our fault. Or option B is we might kill a pedestrian, but it's definitely our fault if we do. And the auto industry answer to this is always A, because of the economics, right? If you kill a pedestrian, it's not your fault, it's the car owner's fault. Yeah. Well, it's desperate, because there's an option between killing a pedestrian and killing the person inside the car. Um, well, again, the auto industry doesn't care who you are, they just don't want it to be their fault, right? <laughs> That's all they care about. And so we're kind of, the fact that we're having these questions about the trolley problem is really good because it means we're moving into a new safety culture where we can think of, like we can think beyond who's fault is it. Um, so I can give you the kind of the glib answer, which is we have an ethics board on our company and we kind of, a lot of these questions are in the future for us, but we've already put down our blanket policy that we treat all human life as equal. So if we kill a child or an old person, or we kill the person in our car or somebody outside, we will rate that as equal, and it's all about probabilities. The kind of the more realistic answer, though it's a less satisfying one, is in a way it doesn't matter because these are the one in a million events. If we can get to the point where choosing who to kill is going to make a real dent in the accident statistics, it's because there are so few accidents that every one of them will be a news headline. I really would like to get to that thing. Um, we're not going to do it alone, but maybe the whole industry can. The right answer to all of these questions of who do you kill is you don't kill anybody. You just stop. <laughs> if you've got time to decide who to kill, you've got time to stop. Uh, sorry, Marcus was first. So, um, risk and driving is usually very, very closely related to the speed that you choose to drive at. Mm -hmm. And many of the prototype cars, uh, Remo and so on, they don't actually drive at the regulation speed. They drive quite a bit slower at the moment. Mm -hmm. Tesla is the exception because they, they do highway and their market is particularly good. Well, um, because it's a driver assist feature, so the, the well, driver decides what speed to go. Ultimately, I think the, the trolley problem is false dichotomy to keep philosophers busy at their conferences. But the real mm -hmm. question is, how fast do you actually go? Because in the end, there will be constants in your software which you can tweak. Are we going faster and accept a higher accident risk, or are we going slower in order mm -hmm. to have? And how, how are we going to adjust those constants, the, the speed selection and the risk that comes with choosing the speed? Mm -hmm. I'm afraid I don't have an answer to that one. I, I don't even know what the trade-off is going to be. That's too far in the future for us. I've uh, talked about this topic once, and some people who's not in the company suggested, oh, you know what, maybe in the app where you get the car to come, you could have a slider of risk versus time. Wouldn't that be yeah. great? <laughs> <laughs> if humans could make that decision, we wouldn't need the self-driving cars. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm afraid I don't have an answer to that. Um, all I can say is this is a question not just for the manufacturers, but also for regulators uh, about how we weigh risk and, and how we value risk. And we are working with regulators. We uh, send people out to the, the offices of the, the people in government who will be writing the regs for self-driving cars because we want them to be sensible regulations. And you know, if you leave the government to themselves, they come up with regulations. They don't always come up with sensible regulations. Do you think your regulations will be written by government or by insurance companies? Well, possibly both. There are, you know, 
there is a government program to do this because there, um, and, I mean, lots of things have been said about the government transport strategy. Without passing any judgment, it's definitely very futuristic and they see a lot of value in investing in technology, which is one of the reasons why we have uh, this government scheme that, that not long time has given this money to, to help do this scheme in London. Um, and in some ways that's not just for the transport benefits, it's also because you know, we're making progress. Um, and they maybe need to help out the tech industry a bit. So the, the government is really keen to do what they can and get a regulatory framework ready for self-driving cars. But because of the, the third bar where we are incentivized to lower the bar as much as we can, really that pressure comes from our insurer. It's not like a where well, you sell a car and everybody has their own insurance company. We have a partnership with one insurance company who's underwriting our whole fleet. So in some ways they will set the bar for us. Uh, I think we're talking about yeah, the lady here. here. Mm -hmm. Could you say something about the uh, trial that you're planning to run in London next year? How's that going to work? Uh, yes, so the, the it's not next year, it's the year after. It's, I think, planned for September 2019. Uh, it's in a, an area of South London. The specific area hasn't been chosen, but it's kind of quite a big region down there where they have kind of three bus routes that just go by that, and uh, the, the buses are a bit like Cambridge really. You know, there's not a lot of availability of buses in that area, and it's kind of between the tube lines, so they're not well served by the tube. And uh, essentially, it's going to be Transport for London that's picking the exact region that we run in. Um, it will be uh, not a fully autonomous system. It will be with safety drivers in all the cars who we employ, and so they're there to take over in case of something unexpected. So in a way, it allows us to do what Tesla are doing now and kind of find out what unexpected situations might come up that we have to plan for. Um, but the intention is that it will be that the, the safety drivers will get bored. That's what we hope to be there to do. Um, and yeah, so it's going to be a, a mobility as a service type system like Uber, where the people in that area can, in that local area, can some cars and it will do some centralized dispatch, so there will be ride sharing uh, and it will help them all to get to where they need to go. Oh, there's lots. I think you've been for ages, yeah. Uh, so um, you talked about cars, mm -hmm. what about other, other buses, lorries, trams? They are all things. Um, there is a, a project that's going on at the moment with, um, it, there's not quite self-driving, the convoys of lorries on the motorway where uh, the, I think the, the plan is the lead one has a driver in it and the others, once they get into convoy, the, the, so I think it's like three in the convoy and once they get in position behind the lead lorry, they will be completely self-driving. But then that's only on the motorway, so it's like a really easy case. It takes out all of the hard things that we saw in those videos earlier. Um, buses are a thing, but you've got the like, custom rash service aspects of that, so that's like a little side problem that has to be solved if we can do that. We're not interested in any of those because um, I'm sure you've seen loads of technology companies that go, oh, we've got this great technology, it could do these hundred things, let's try and do all of them, and they have no focus, and, and they just never get to market. So we are doing this one thing, um, and good luck to anybody who's doing the others. Okay. Do tell me if we run yeah, out of time for questions. Yes. <laughs> Go on. Um, so, do you have a view on how self-driving cars may impact road design and design of places that are uh, That's very interesting, actually. I don't think I do yet, mainly because I think this is a big UK-US difference. Uh, in the US, they have. Um, huge roads and they're all very cleanly marked and they're very structured so all, and, and you know we don't have this grid layout right so they're yeah, a lot more structured Boston, have you? <laughs> <laughs> well okay Boston, Boston well I mean there are some places everywhere right but on the whole it's a lot more predictable in terms of the road layout whereas over here we have our medieval towns um, the, the, I talk to the engineers who work for these companies in the US because you know we all talk to each other we're not all in little isolated pockets 
and sometimes I tell them, oh, you know, there's this road near me that uh, has a roundabout, and then one of the exits of the roundabout is wide enough for two cars, but it's only one lane, and then it just goes into being wide enough for one lane, and then we park cars all down one side of the road, and it's not marked, it's they just park there. And they're like, wow, what is this? What's this roundabout thing you see now? <laughs> <laughs> they, they really can't get to grips with how bizarre our road layouts are here. So the way we're planning for our cars to work is that we have to take account of all of these road layout issues. Uh, so we kind of were not planning for planners to make any changes to the way they build roads because it won't benefit us because we still have to run on all these old roads. Um, you do see uh, places like airports and railway stations where they have taxi ranks. Some of them have now introduced essentially Uber ranks. They're not called that. They're called like lift share meeting points or something. Um, and so like, there's already changes, even without self-driving, that kind of the, the new forms of mobility are influencing design. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know how that's going to end up. Can I add to that? Just, so if we're reducing, I don't, I don't say that we might be able to reduce the number of cars, so all of a sudden mm -hmm. we're going to have streets where previously it was filled with parked cars and all of a sudden we've got space. Also, what's the implication is like this, will we just, do you think we might distract from the really insegregated infrastructure? because? You'll all be safe now with these um, vehicles. That seems like a, a far future thing. Because as I say, we're not getting, getting rid of all motorists, yeah. only the really dangerous ones who don't do it very often. Um, so I don't think there'll be a, a big enough change for everyone to go, yay, no segregation anymore. And you know, it's not like we see councils falling over themselves to anticipate changes in road usage. Mm -hmm. You say, you know, well, you know, this new scheme will have half as many cars and twice as many bikes, so you don't need all this car parking anymore. They go, well, okay, let's reduce the number of cars first, and then we might take out some car parking when nobody's using it anymore. And so you get this vicious cycle thing. So I don't see that. I don't see any proactivity coming out of the councils. That said, the the organisation that's funding us is the uh, Centre for Connected Autonomous Vehicles. They've done a lot of stuff on other kinds of ride sharing schemes, and they are funding. Uh, projects at the moment, well, they're, they're considering applications at the moment for projects that are about like future planning implications of all of these projects that are going to be coming out in the next couple of years, uh, and how planners will be able to simulate those changes and see what effects they'll have on their towns. Go on, you've been waiting for ages. Um, how would you like to speak communicating with users about where to collect them from and where to take them to? Uh, and my particular concern is about things that you I can understand if it's you know, so in terms of the uh, what we call the user experience for the end user um, we haven't even started working on that yet we're just trying to get it working first and then like the, the making an app that can communicate with the car is the easy part um, so we, we've decided not even to but there are a load of interesting design problems about uh, how do you make the car aware that sometimes it's okay to go into these driveway because that's where you're picking them up from, or you know, sometimes it's okay to go into the valet parking area because you're dropping them off at hotel or whatever. Roads that you wouldn't normally go down. Um, and um, you, know, you just have to plan for it and then do it, right? <laughs> right? Is there an advantage in the cars being able to communicate with each other? Um, so, for that particular case, I don't think there is because the car behind would need to be able to identify the cyclist even if it didn't have any help. So, if we once we've set that safety bar, if we have to meet it every time, there's no point in having all the cars. Like having this extra layer of complexity, introducing the complexity makes it less safe, not more safe. So, for that kind of thing, I don't see it, but. Um, you do get uh, circumstances like bus drivers who work for the same company that often let people figure out preferentially. So it might be that we end up with a system like that where uh, you know one of the cars can signal, oh, I've been stuck waiting to pull out here for 10 minutes, could you let me out please? Mm -hmm. and go, oh yeah, I can let you out. And then the person behind crashes into the van because it's a human driver. <laughs> go ahead. Are there any contingencies for um, any emergency like a passenger falling ill having a heart attack in the back seat? Yes, so again, that aspect of the service isn't something we're designing yet. Um, we're going to look at that next year. 
Uh, I think it's very likely though that we'll have an interior camera um, that would be kind of the same interaction that you'd get from a taxi driver who's in the front and, and looking at you in the mirror. Um, and almost certainly voice recognition, so that, you know, if you want to tell the car, oh actually I'll walk the rest of the way, pull up here, that kind of thing, you can do that. Um, and so, yeah, I think we will have a system that can recognize uh, if the, the passenger is in distress, if they've died or something, um, and we can act accordingly. Go ahead. So the fundamental problem I see with this sort of system is the economics of maintenance of roads. Because at the moment, you know, I own a car and it costs me £400 a year to tax it and I drive a few thousand miles. Mm -hmm. Very little because most of the time I'm cycling to work. So the government's getting lots of money from me to repair the damage that I do. The implication from what you're saying is that your vehicles are going to be on the road for 24 hours a day, pretty much, um, and driving pretty much most of the time. Um, and they're electric, so they won't pay any car tax. Exactly. <laughs> and therefore heavier, and we all know that the damage to the road is, what, square or... Uh, fourth power, of, fourth power of, yeah. of mass. So how does that work? You know, who actually then pays for the road to be repaired? Oh, good question. But, I mean, we already know, as you said, that the economics are not evenly distributed according to road use at the moment. Um, so it, it's likely that there will be some, as part of the new regulations, there will be some changes into how road is charged for. Um, I expect we will probably be signaled out as a heavy business user because you know they wouldn't like to make the business users pay for things. Um, but I, I can't see how that will go. I, I'm not a, a politician. I'm not an economist. I'm just a software developer. So I, I can't answer those rarefied uh, strategy questions. I'm afraid. But yeah, I'm sure there will be some changes because, as you say, the, you know we would be kind of taking advantage of. Uh, a perk that was introduced to get people to switch over to electric, that you know, maybe we'd be taking too much of a benefit from that, more than we intended. Most of, t most of the cost of running the roads already comes out of general taxation. Yeah, but the, it's kind of, it's quite a fat car tax and uh, fuel duty bill that adds to that, though. even though it's not it's enough to pay for it, it's still quite a lot of money. Yeah. Isn't there any existence of companies such as yours and to some degree a reflection of failing the public policy. In the in the filtered areas or in cities where you don't have the city traffic problem because they have the infrastructure, the fire sequence and policies and people don't use their cars all the time. Mm -hmm. And that maybe I, I don't know what the relative costs are, but maybe it's cheaper actually just to say, hey, actually you know, you need to do what some of these European cities do. Maybe, I mean there's a lot of Leg road legacy questions about making our cities more European, and of course, there's you know, some political will issues, right? Um, but we are certainly, once we've conquered London, we're certainly planning to expand into Europe. There's a lot of issues about different uh, driving styles in different countries. So, like a self driving car that works in the UK maybe would not want to go around the old Triumph in Paris, and it definitely wouldn't work in Delhi. Um, <laughs> which is one of the reasons why we're doing business in the UK when there's all of these big people over in the US with lots of money than us because we think that, you know, that they can't understand our roads at all and their cars definitely won't be able to at first. And so if it's going to take them another three years, say, to, to get over here, even after they've got fully working cars in the US, that's a head start for us, effectively. Um, but it's, I think there is just as much appetite for self-driving cars on the continent as here. And, you know, although the safety benefits are good and Kind of accessibility of transport is good. Freeing up human labour is also a benefit, and it's kind of that's a, a large part of the economic driver for the people who will be paying for this all time. Go ahead. So I'm interested in the relationship of which I'm the humans have we are basically describing. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about something that people can use in the urban yep. and the taxi. Mm -hmm. um, Presumably, your cars will have the knowledge in the way that taxi drivers do. Yes, in the way the taxi drivers sometimes have. <laughs> um, but also, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in the sort of advantage over taxi. I mean, you, you said the major disadvantage of taxi is the expensive, and that's mm -hmm. entirely an artificial thing. 
It's not entirely not a thing. So if mm -hmm. we look at places where Uber is operating, they mm -hmm. are typically half as expensive as a taxi, but they're making a loss on that service. So mm -hmm. except in London, London's the only city in the world where Uber is running at profit. All of the other cities where they run, they're subsidizing the service. Why? Because they want the taxis out of business, take over all the drivers, make it cheaper, and get new people on their service, right? This mm -hmm. is how you do business in the, in the dot-com age. You, you tell all, your, or all of your investors that you will have lots of customers and, and you can charge them more afterwards. Um, so. But still the primary cost in running their service is paying for a human to go and drive around and to wait for, to be ready for somebody to summon them. And so it, it is driving. still autonomy. So removing the human from the economic equation will make it a lot more will be as cheap as a bus. Maybe even cheaper. So, so that actually raises another question in my mind. You keep saying, well, you, you started the talk saying that it was a way of filling in the holes in the public transport network, mm -hmm. which for me, you know, I live on the north side of Cambridge, uh, you know, past, past Cambridge, and then you go past Histon, and finally you get to Cobham. But, you know, the people who live out on Long Drove, you know, there's no bus within a mile of their house. Yeah. So for them, it's an ideal sort of thing. But for them to then take that auto autonomous vehicle right into the centre of Cambridge feels wrong to me. So you'd rather have like an autonomous parking line? I'd rather have an autonomous get me to the nearest bus stop that has very good service to get me into the centre of town. Mm. Well, I mean, it's possible that that will be a thing. I mean... So taxi, you could get a taxi right to King's Cross if you wanted, but nobody does that. You still would rather get a taxi to the train station. And so I see that still being a thing that people do with autonomous cars, even though they're cheaper. That's no reason to spend more money than you have to. It's the sort of thing, though, that you depend on the need. I mean, my boss will on occasion take a taxi from Cambridge to his work. It takes about the same amount of time as well. Exactly. Yeah. yeah and if you get on the Heathrow Express, yeah, it's not much cheaper. And then when he comes back, you know, I get a lot of the, the receipts for Heathrow Express and mm -hmm. you've got to go and fit and then a taxi from Cambridge. Yeah, so people do presumably use them, you know, in different ways and different circumstances. Yeah. Well, I mean, the circumstances are a lot. Like sometimes the reason you don't do a journey by bike and you might get a taxi or uh, you might drive your own car or a high car or something is not because of where you're going, it's because of what you're doing. It's because you've got a box load of stuff in the back, it's because you're in a suit and it's raining and you don't want to get wet that day. Um, there's a lot of other factors in, in these decisions, but uh, by providing a kind of a, a new dimension, a new modality of transport will make it easier for people to make this less damaging decision and therefore reduce the temptation for them to own the car. Yeah, well, I'm also interested in the way that you'll be able to adjust to the passenger's needs and take someone from, oh, I've got a letter I must go to, I must go to stop at the cash point. Mm -hmm. uh, well, as I say, so, um, you know, the kind of the, 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 the yeah, user yes. interface to it yeah. is a thing for us to worry about next year, but uh, I do anticipate that we'll have a kind of some kind of voice interface inside the car so that you can say, oh, I need to go down this way, maybe not quite like that. But you can tell it to pull over and it can pull over and it can wait for you while you're doing your thing. Um, yeah. I think so there's all kinds of possibilities. Let's just, you know, that's we're obviously an institution. That's actually, it relates to the, the talk we had a couple of weeks ago about um, upgrade bikes. Oh, yeah. They need the, the hardware mm -hmm. or something. Do you need I think there are two more questions here, yeah. Yeah, so I think these will be the last two then? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, mean, I, I assume there's a pub trip afterwards. Yeah. Okay, so I'll be at the pub trip afterwards. You can ask me that. I might give you more illuminating answers if you find me ready. Go ahead. Uh, could you say something about uh, ride sharing and whether the car could be designed in a different way to accommodate ride sharing? Mm -hmm. philosophy. So, um, oh, I wish I had a picture of the car actually. So we have like a, it's a bit of a concept art because we don't have the, you know, the physical car yet. Um, but our plan for the um, the final car, this is not for this. So the, the one that we're running in London for this trial in two years, we'll have a safety driver, so we'll still have all the controls. And they take up a load of space. Who would put those in cars? <laughs> um, but it will be a six. It'll be a six seater taxi essentially. So it'll be like a black cab, um, plenty of room have other people in there, you're not that, you know, you don't have to get chummy with them to put it on the back seat like you're doing a normal car. Um, the cars that we run for the, the 
the kind of the production system when we're running everywhere will not even have the steering wheel in. They will be completely self-driving mm -hmm. and they're designed for that from the start. And so they'll have, they'll also be six seater, but they'll be quite spacious. And we might even end up with layout that's like three facing backwards from the front and three facing forwards. So like the back of a cab, but taking up the space of the whole car. <coughs> uh, so we would, we would kind of had a cut off on questions. This is the last one. Right, we'll come to the pub. I was just going to ask about the um, they're electric cars, mm -hmm. so you need a rapid charging system, um, a network of rapid charging um, <laughs> for you to use them. Mm -hmm. How's that going to be implemented? Um, so we're um, partnering with a fleet management company. We'll be using their depots and charging in their depots. And of course, the cars will have to keep track of how much charge they have left. Yeah. So if they can't do any more journeys, they'll, they'll go back to the depot on their own so that they can charge up. Uh, don't get me started on charging because the, the car that we're using at the moment, the one in the video at the start, mm -hmm. it's a rubbish range. Because I wanted to put a rapid charging station on our drive, and my husband mm -hmm. doesn't like that idea. <laughs> <laughs> Is it because it has old Bluetooth rather than new Bluetooth? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like yes, I uh, just wanted to, just to me, when I take my question at the pub, it was just that when you gave your presentation, you, you talked about some software systems such as ABS. Mm -hmm. And it could also add like aircraft control systems, and, and mm -hmm. our cars already have computer systems in them. But what we do know about all those systems is that they are generally kept to be as simple as possible, and everything about them is checked. Every property, every condition, every input, uh, you know, they, they measure things down to uh, the, the time it takes to get data from cache and memory and account for that. Mm -hmm. So it cycles on the processor, and also they account for, let's say, if a cosmic ray comes and strikes the computer. <laughs> So, uh, what you're talking about in terms of software is probably the most, by far, of orders of magnitude, by far the most complicated piece of software ever to be put into a safety critical system. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that worries me. <laughs> Let me yeah. say. It, it worries us as well, which is both, you know, possibly the most reassuring thing I can say, because if we're worried about it, we're going to. Let me put it this way. But yeah, you're completely right. Uh, Your the, smartphone has hand fancy software on it, and when it crashes, it's annoying. But when your car crashes because it has fancy software on it, it's a little bit more. Yeah. So I mean, uh, although the safety critical parts of automotive systems at the moment are very simple, like the an average every car has ten million lines of code in it, which is quite a lot, um, and they use a lot of isolation to to keep the safety critical parts as small as possible. Uh, and there are techniques that you can do, even though we've got the. The function that we're trying to learn is very complicated. There are techniques that you can use, uh, such as active monitor systems, so that you can keep the actual safety critical part much smaller. Um, and as I say, you can have redundancy so that if uh, you can detect it, if uh, components are producing wrong answers and shutting down or take over. The existing techniques that motor manufacturers and the aviation industry as well. Um, use to manage safety critical systems do not scale to this problem, and I think that's quite right. So we need new techniques. Well, that's just, how do you test the machine learning algorithm that recognizes a person on the road? How do you even say, yes, that works every time? Yeah, so um, this maybe <laughs> is a tough question because it's yeah, uh, a, a, a big issue, issue. but really um, the, it comes down to simulation. We can simulate any combination of events and we can uh, directed testing to like fuzzing really. Um, we can look at the because the algorithms we use can self-report on the, the uncertainty on you know how long they are. We can increase the complexity of the scenario that we're simulating until they go wrong so that we can find all the value points of the system. Thank you. Uh, and I guess both well, yeah it's nine ten so I'm just um, thank you. Uh,